which way are we going to face? <laughs> this is awkward. East is that way. The altar's that way. The altar's, the altar's also. That's kind of like not a real altar because I'm wearing my shoes. All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and everyone, God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. It's a good day, Lord. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity that we may gather again, Lord. We can dive into your word. And I know that when we are in your word, Lord, that you do amazing things with us, Lord. And you speak to us. And you saturate us, Lord. So, Lord, I ask that today be so much more than just us looking at your words, Lord. I ask that we just, we take them in, Lord, that they change us. I ask that, uh, that your presence just fill this upper room right now. I ask that, uh, that you just pour me out, Lord, that, that this isn't, like, let this not be about me at all, Lord. Let it all be about you, your words, your message. I ask that the message be specific for every single one of us in this room, Lord, that we walk away with something that might not just be something nice to hear, but something that is applicable. We give you permission, Lord, to aspect, to ask, just to, to have full access to aspects of our life that we might be hiding from you, Lord. Because, Lord, we want to grow. So I ask that you use this meeting, Lord, to sanctify us, Lord, to grow us, so that we have a better image of you and that we may become a better image of you. I ask that your Holy Spirit wrestle with hearts during this message, Lord, and that, that you give us something to take away and to apply into our life, Lord, that we may walk out of this room never the same. I ask these prayers lifted through the intercessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, St. Tokos. St. Mary, all the saints and martyrs, here as we pray in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, by the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you personally, it feels really, really good to tell you guys, welcome back to the adult meeting at HTC. And um, we took a short break. Does anyone know how long the break was? <laughs> uh, no, actually, the break was for probably about five or six months, right? And I will tell you, I don't know if you guys missed this meeting, but I have really, really missed this meeting, and it feels great for us all to be together again. Um, so I'm really excited about it, and I am hoping that we all can be excited about this meeting. Um, because sometimes, you know, there's that saying that says you never really realize, you know, what you have until it's gone. So I'm hoping that over the last six months, we've realized that something is missing. And I hope that because we've realized that something is missing, we'll be much more diligent in attending um, and committing to, like, this meeting. And my goal is that we outgrow this room. Okay, not because this is numbers oriented, right? But I would like to see that so many people are full, so many people are overflowing, that so many people are coming back and enjoying what God wants to do in their life, that there's not enough seats here. And then we have to find somewhere else to meet. Like that's kind of my goal here. Um, and, and I'm meeting that, I'm, I'm praying not just that we're full, but that we're full and we're fruitful. Because if we're full and not fruitful, then we're wasting each other's time. Right? The whole purpose we get together is to be, you know, fruitful. And one of the things that I've realized is where whenever you come across the word of God and good soil, what will you find? Fruit. Right? Like, it's, it's as simple as that. So we will do our best to make sure that there's, you know, always the word of God presented in an applicable way that we can, we can apply and learn from. And what you guys need to do is you guys just need to focus to make sure that you're showing up every Sunday with good soil. Deal? Deal. Okay. Um, so did anyone notice that what we're going to be talking about for the next five weeks? Which book of the Bible it is? James. Okay, I like that. Um, and, and I love this because when we're trying to figure out, and I want to give you guys kind of like a high level, behind the curtain view of what this is meant to be. We believe that at HTC, this isn't just about you, right? One of the whole reasons that this church was started is we wanted to have a great place to create godly families, you know, and it started with all of these kids 10 years ago when they were like this tall and getting them like a really good Sunday school program and watching them grow into the godly like boys and girls that they are right now. But 
we have to be completely clear about something and it's all connected, right? So to have godly kids, right? What do we need to be? Godly parents, right? And then we've got to have strong relationships because it would be a total miss if we did a great job with your kids, but we lost the parents along the way, right? And we also know that it's a total miss because you can't really have great kids without godly parents, or at least your, your percentage of, of success goes way down. But the goal is for us to have these, like to have a holy family. And the way to do that is to promote what, not just what happens here, but to find a way to make that go back to your homes with you. So there is a reason why today we're going to be covering the Epistle of St. James chapter 1, and then next Saturday, what are your kids going to be hearing? Chapter 1. Mary, that was an introduction, but that's why I have the mic, Mary. That's why I have the mic, Mary. But it's okay. <laughs> I'm just joking. I love you, Mary. I'm just joking. <laughs> but the goal is because we're giving it to the parents first, and then what we're hoping for is that you can engage your kids, right? If you're talking about James one this week, it gives you a whole week to kind of think about it. And when they hear about it next week, we are hoping that some of this stuff trickles over to the dinner table. Right, that we can actually have the whole family at home talking about spiritual things and, and just investing into that. So that's, that's, that's kind of like where it all starts for us. And when we get into James 1, which now that you guys know that every Sunday, what are we going to be talking about? James. Um, but even after James, every Sunday we're going to be talking about the Bible. And I just did the youth meeting on Friday night. I don't know. I don't know. Actually, there would be no junior high kids in here. But um, I was talking to them, and one of the things I was talking about is a physical Bible with pages different than an electronic Bible. What do you guys think? If you think it's the same, raise your hand. I'm not going to judge you. Okay? Okay, you think it's the same. Oh, not the same? Okay, not the same? Okay. Or just nobody else raised their hand, and now you don't want to? Okay, I get you. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. But you think it's the same? You think it's the same? Okay. So I will be a respecter of that, but personally, I think it's different, okay? I think that there's, there's something powerful about a page with Bibles. When I open it up, I have full landscape on what one and two and three. I have my, all of this other stuff. It, it feels different when I highlight here as, like, do I have it on my phone? I have it in my phone, but that's almost like a, that's like my plan B. And I believe that it's a game changer when you have a personal relationship with your Bible. Like, it's important to you, you like it, you carry it around, you go to it when you have spare time. And I will tell you, in my 46 years of existence, I've never been reading my, my paper Bible and gotten a notification on it. <laughs> and that in itself is a game changer. Because you could be in your electronic Bible, and then something steals your attention. And it's really hard to kind of get back to like where you kind of were. My other beef with the, with the electronic Bible is when you're looking at it on the screen, um, your best case scenario is you're looking at maybe like five verses that's not laid out very well. So you're only looking at what you're looking at. So long story short, I encourage us to start bringing our Bibles. Is that reasonable? I'm going to tell you, if you don't take your Bible to church, where are you going to take it? So I think like if you're going to take your Bible somewhere, like the highest probability is it's going to be to church. And I would love to be at church where people had their Bibles, and when we open up the Bible and we're reading through it, you could be highlighting, you could be taking notes, and you can be doing something with that, okay? So um, I just, it's, it's a recommendation, but I would love to see next week if physical Bible started showing up. But because I didn't give you guys um, a heads up on that, you can take out your electronic Bible. <laughs> and hopefully open to James 1, because I hope, like, guys, I, you guys got to put in a little bit of the work here, Okay. So if you can at least open up your electronic Bible to James 1 and kind of follow along with what we're going through, that would be great. So it starts, obviously, with, his, with an introduction. And what I love here about St. James is he, he's introducing himself as a bondservant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And I think a lot of the times we hear this word bondservant, and we've kind of gotten used to it. He's over there. He saved you a spot. <laughs> so, 
And I think we hear this term bond servant, and if we're honest, we've gotten used to it. And we forget that this is a guy who's basically introducing himself. He's like, I'm a slave. Like, I'm a slave, and I'm a slave to our Lord and our Savior, right? And it spoke to, like, that is actually, not only is it like, wow, like, he considered himself to be a slave, but that is how he introduced himself to people. Like, that was his level of commitment and how, like, the devotion to his calling that he high, he had. And guys, that is a very, very high calling. And for some of us, we take a lot of pride of what we do, right? Like, when we introduce ourselves, we love to throw out our profession. We love to throw out what we do for a living. But that's because a lot of us do things that are a lot better than a slave. But for St. James, that's all he wanted to be, and that is, that's where he found his identity, right? And to be honest with you, I pray that we can be a fraction of how devoted he was in what Christ was calling him to do. Like just to be just, just a little bit, right? But to be that committed. And then he takes a turn. So he gets his introduction out of the way. And then you think that he's writing to, you know, this epistle and it says he's writing it to the, to the tribes, um, to the 12 tribes that are scattered. So it's kind of like a general message. And you think about writing something to somebody, he, he starts it in a way that's not very appealing, right? Because he starts out talking about trials. That's not a feel-good message, like right off the bat. Matter of fact, you start thinking about the reader of that, right? <laughs> if that's where we're starting, it's like, maybe I'm going to put this, maybe I'll read this later, right? So as the reader, that might be a turnoff, right? But for St. James, he's starting with, the most important thing, right? Like this is, I'm going to start with the most important thing. And he says specifically, my brethren, count it all joy. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. Like all joy, okay, all joy. When you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let the patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfected and complete, lacking nothing. What? What? Why? Um, like, why would he start there, right? And, and the thing is, is he, he starts, he doesn't say, if you fall into trials. I wish it said, if you fall into trials. I, every single one of us here wishes it was, if you fall into trials. But he doesn't say that. He says, when you fall into trials. And if we were honest, as Christians living in the world that we're living in now, and I'll be honest with you, living in the part of the world that we're living in now, you know, there is a flaw in our belief system because we somehow have adopted the idea that living a Christian life would be comfortable. That, that almost because now that we are professing faith and we are walking, you know, with, with Christ, that somehow his blessings will pour out over all of that and we will be exempted from like the hardship that some of the other people will have to go into. But unfortunately, it's that that's not true. And one of the things I always think about is each one of us in this room either just got out of a trial, you might be right smack into a trial. And if you're not one of those two, you're probably someone that up ahead the road a little bit, you're going to be facing a trial. You know, I remember one time I was talking with uh, Emba Bulis. And I was talking to him about Africa and how it must be hard to live there and all of this other stuff. And I remember he said something that just forever kind of like marked me. And he says, Peter, I traveled the whole world. Like I have kids everywhere. You know what I mean? Like I'll go visit London. I'll visit Germany. I'll visit North America, South America, like, you know, Europe, all of these places. He's like, but Peter, everywhere I go, life is hard. The question is, what type of hard is it? Right? And I think we forget that sometimes. Right. And I'll confess personally that I love my Bible. I have, a, you know, I, I, I love spending time in it. And the story that comes to mind is Matthew seven, where it talks about the two houses. Right. You have a house built on sand and you have a house built on rock. Which one does a storm hit? Both. And I'm not going to lie. There's a period of time where I only thought that the house it hit the house that was built on the sand. I completely overlooked the, how, the fact that it hit both houses. 
And I will tell you, it's, it's, it's a humbling reminder that the storm is promised. It's going, it's going to come, or it has come, or you might be in the thick of it right now. But why? Why these storms? Uh, the storms, and then it says that knowing that the testing produces patience, then having its perfect work. So let's think about that for a second, right? It says that the trials don't produce faith. Faith is not something we get out of trials, okay? It reveals our faith. We can definitely agree with that, right? But faith isn't required when times are good. Faith is easy when times are good. We enjoy it. But when does faith, when, when does it start coming out? How strong your faith is comes out when the trials are hard. That's when we get to really see what things are all about, right? But it says that this produces patience, right? Well, okay, then, well, let's take a second. Let's talk about faith, right? Because I need a strong faith if I'm going to go through trials, right? Because the trials will only produce the patience. But how do I get the faith? Because I think that's where we need to start. And I love this because in Romans 10, 17, it says, so then faith comes by, any guesses? I wish, that'd be a total, that'd be a doozy. We wouldn't even know where to go from there. Um, by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. And by hearing the word of God. Well, we're in the right place then, aren't we? We're in the right place. And if our faith isn't strong, then maybe we need to spend more time in the word of God. Will we believe that God is good? Will we believe, like when, when times are good, we believe it all day long. But when times are hard, will we still believe that God is good? Will we trust in him enough that even when things don't seem good, that somehow he can bring good from it? See, because trials reveal the faith that we have, not because God doesn't know how much. Does God know how much faith that you have? What do you think? God knows. Sometimes, who doesn't know how much faith we have? Yeah, we don't know. And I will be honest with you, sometimes we give ourselves way too much faith than, than, than we probably deserve that credit for. So sometimes these trials come to reveal to ourselves how much we still need, right? But then you still get caught up in this whole thing of like trials produce patience. Well, it can, because I guarantee you all of us here have gone through a trial that it probably didn't produce patience. It probably produced something completely, completely different. You know, it, it might have produced a little bit of bitterness, discouragement, defeat. Because when we go through these trials, we decide what it gives us. Our perspective decides what it gives us. And if we are full of faith, then it can give us patience. But if we lack faith, then we're defeated and our God is no good to us. And I think that's something that we really need to think about, right? And then I love that because he says, and remember, count it all as joy. Which sounds like a total oxymoron. Like, how do I count it all as joy? That doesn't make any sense at all. But I want to make a point to something. Is he doesn't say, feel it all as joy. Because when we're going through hardships and trials, the last thing that we're feeling is joy. Right? We, <laughs> I don't know that guy who is going through trials and feels it as joy. But I think there's wisdom in what St. James is saying here where he says, count it as joy. Because that's, that's, a, that's a wisdom thing, right? This hardship you're going from, good can come from it, right? God can use this for good. So I'm going to ask you to count it all as joy because I'm asking you to see what's going to come from it. There's going to be resurrection here. But I just need you to have faith in that and to see that. And then he goes on and he says, and if we lack wisdom, if we lack wisdom, Again, I love the wording here, um, but I will tell you, should it say if? On this one, I almost wish it could say when. When we lack wisdom. Because I think every single one of us has been there, 
And he tells us that during the hard times, that is when we need to seek wisdom. And we usually don't realize that we even have a need for wisdom until things get hard. Because we don't care to pursue wisdom when things are okay. See, because in, in, in hard times, we need wisdom more than we need knowledge. Because knowledge is just having a comprehension of the raw information that's available to you. Wisdom is knowing what to do with it. And there's this whole concept of wisdom that I can get lost in it, right? Because um, I love this part because in verse 5, it says, As him who gives liberally, without reproach, and it will be given to him liberally, it's basically saying that Christ is willing to give you the wisdom. Not only does he want to give you wisdom, but he will give it to you liberally. And I think when you think about that, you're like, that sounds great. I would love to have that, right? But God wants us to be wise. He wants to give it to us. And I'm going to ask all of us here, what would each one of our houses look like if we had a little bit more wisdom? As the parents, right? As the fathers, as the mothers, right? What would our houses look like if there was more wisdom? Because if I was honest with you, I love this book. When it comes to raising my kids, 90% of the time, I feel like I'm shooting from the hip. Because there's a lot of circumstances that are not covered in that book. But we need to pray that God gives us wisdom in that. And he is willing. He will give it to us. When it comes to like raising kids, when it comes to hard situations at work, when it comes to a wife who is just so much better than you could have ever hoped for. <laughs> um, like there are certain aspects... <laughs> You like that one? All right. There's certain aspects that we don't know how to necessarily navigate through because it's not clear in this book. But the same Holy Spirit that wrote this book and all the principles of that book is inside of us. And we pray that he reveals these things to us in his wisdom so that we can do it. And how do we do it? How do we get it? By not doubting. See, because here's the thing is if you remove doubt, because we all have doubt, don't we? We have doubt in situations. We have doubt in, in how we feel about ourselves. To be honest, we have doubt with how we feel about God, right? But when we remove doubt, what is left? It's faith. Hoping in the things that are not seen, right? We cannot receive without faith. And it floors me when you go through the Gospels and you see that there are cities that Christ himself was walking through. And he is limited in the miracles that he can do because of the lack of the faith of the people. And one of my prayers is, God, don't ever put me in a situation where you want to do something and I am preventing you because of lack of my faith. So then, say James takes this weird little detour. He starts talking about the rich man and the, and the, and the lowly man. I'm not going to cover that because it's just not in line with what we're talking about. You can read it on your own. But then it comes right back to hardship and temptation. And I want you guys to look at verse 12. You guys still have your electronic Bibles? Nobody's got their electronic Bibles. Another great reason to have a, a paper Bible, right? Because a paper Bible, the screen doesn't go black on you and you can't cross your arms. I'm not calling you out. Everyone else over there has got their crossed out arms too. But when you have your physical Bible open, it just stays open. But anyways, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man. Do you want to be blessed? I want to be blessed. You know, I love this, right? And the thing I love about this is that verse right there, it sounds to me a lot like Matthew 5's in the Beatitudes. Blessed is the, blessed is the, blessed is the, blessed is the, right? And don't you love how when people, when you get people who spend so much time together, what do they start doing? They start, to start, they, they start sounding like each other. And here you see St. James sounding a lot like his master. Right? Like, just, he sounds a lot like Christ. And it's so convincing. And I'm so convicting because you got here, you got this scenario where St. Saint, Saint James sounds a lot like his master because he spent so much time with him, right? But there's this parallel example, right, where, you know, St. Peter, during his denial, you know, Matthew 26, 73, it says, Those who came up said to Peter, 
Surely you are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Because St. Peter has spent so much time with Christ that even the way he spoke, he gave it away, right? And what was the only way that St. Peter could convince them otherwise? Yes. See, because it says that to convince them, he began to curse and swear and says, I do not know the man. That was the only way, right? And when I read that, and I was like, I wonder who I sound more like. If people were just going to listen to me, am I more of a St. James or am I more of a St. Peter? Like when it comes to my language, when it comes to the way that I talk, am I more of the world or am I more of my master? And I think that that's something, it's something that's hard for us to kind of wrap our mind around, right? But I love what he says here, right? He doesn't say, blessed is a man who is never tempted. He also doesn't say, blessed is a man who finds it easy to conquer temptation. Instead, he says, the blessing goes to the person who endures temptation, who struggles with it, who wrestles with it, right? Well, I'll be honest with you, that that could be every single one of us here. Because I don't think there's anyone in here that just doesn't get tempted at all, right? I'll be honest with you, and I don't mean, I'll only speak to myself, but I don't know. I don't think there's anyone here that when temptation rises up, it's just an easy victory. But each one of us are qualified here because we're going to have to struggle and we're going to have to endure, but we're going to be the ones who are going to be blessed. And then he says that that guy, the guy who, who struggles and wrestles and endures through temptation, he will receive a crown. And there's this, there's this misconception, right? Because a lot of people, when we think about like, oh, and he will receive a crown, we start thinking, great, right? I'm going to live this long life here of like struggle and hardship and this and that and all of this other stuff. And when I die, I'll get a crown. That's not an appealing, like that's not an appealing gig. But I love this because when the rich young ruler left, right, and Christ basically told him, you know, anyone who leaves this and this and this and this and this, you know, he says, you will receive a hundredfold here and an eternal life. So guys, I, the, the only point I'm saying that is that the, the Christian walk and the struggle and the enduring, it is not just live this hard life here that's going to, you know, it's going to make your life really, really hard and miserable so that when you get to heaven, you can, you can be in paradise forever. But heaven starts here inside of us. In the presence of God, like, if you go up to somebody that you respect spiritually here, are they miserable? I hope not. (laughs) If they are, get them help, right? (laughs) But but according to the Bible, the walk with Christ, it has, you know, you look at St. John, who's, I mean, St. John, St. Paul, who's living in chains, and he says again and again, uh, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Like, there should be so much joy in living the life that we're living in, even though we're going through hardships, even though we're suffering through temptation, it should still be filled with so much joy. And and I think that sometimes we forget that, right? Because it's worth it. There will be a reward here and in heaven. But how we resist temptation when it's so strong. And I'm going to tell you, it's just that sometimes that temptation, it's so strong it can only be overcome with a greater passion. And I think sometimes that's where we're missing it, right? If your passion is to love, to honor, and to bring glory for Christ, it's got to be so strong that it outweighs the love for sin in our life. And that's that's a problem so many times we focus on, how do I stifle this out, right? Like, how do I just get away from this sin? And I'm going to tell you, how about you look at what you should be doing, right? Feed yourself spiritually more. Be more committed. Increase that. And throw yourself all in onto Christ, right? And when your passion for him and your love for him increases, you will notice that the desires for some of the other things will be washed away, right? It's because of that that Joseph, when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. It wasn't about how enticing the sin was, because I guarantee you it was enticing. 
but it was about his love for God that said that is so much greater for me. <clears throat> and we need to remember also Hebrews eleven six, 6, which is one of my favorite verses. And it says, he who, who, he who comes to God must believe, must believe that he is and that he is rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Can you imagine that our God is a rewarder and he wants to reward you? Let no one say that I am tempted by God. Each one is tempted by his own desires. And he wrote this because there were people at that time that who were they blaming? They were blaming God for how they were being tempted. And I'm sure that that was something from a really long time ago. and We don't do that anymore. Um, but those desires are inside of us. He didn't put them there. Right? I love this. One of the most convicting stories is when Christ tells St. Peter, he says, Satan has been asking for you. Like, imagine that. He says, Satan has been asking for you. And then he tells him, he says, but when you fall, get back up. And I think it was like, restore the brethren. Right? I remember I was reading that verse and I was like, why would you let him fall? Like, you're Christ. C couldn't you just prevent the fall? St. Peter needed the fall. Because St. Peter had pride inside of his heart. So God says, okay, you know what? I need to get that pride out. And the only way I'm going to get that pride out is I'm going to let you fall. And I'm going to taste the bitterness of your sin. And then after you taste the bitterness of your sin, I'll restore you. So there's times where we've got stuff going on inside of us. It's not because God's tempting us. It's our own evil desires inside of us. And God will be like, if that's, if that's what you choose, then just after you fall, be restored. Be restored and we will get all of that stuff out. Yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. I think it's the crown of life for me, it's, it's the reward, it's everything. But the thing is, is when you say when you're going to receive a crown, it's a crown in heaven, but I also believe that it's happiness here. So it's not like this whole thing where we're going to live this miserable life here, and then when we get to heaven, that was my only point, was that when we get to heaven, that's when we're going to be happy. It, like, it starts here. Then they're doing it wrong. And, and, the, and for those people, and we're going to take a little bit of a detour, but for those people, where are you looking for joy? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why so many people are miserable is because they're looking for joy in the wrong areas and it's not sustaining them. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, sorry. Um, and all of those desires that are inside of us, we work to crucify them daily. Because I, like, if you really want to think about something that's going to depress you, um, every sin, the worst sin that you ever committed in your whole entire life started as a single thought the worst sin started as a single thought which means you could have avoided that whole situation if you would have just brought that thought captive and squashed it out when it was small right and that just it just blows your mind when you kind of think about that right because the thought gives birth to sin any action started as a thought and then you get into that action, and then every sin, do they stay the same size? If you have a single sin in your life that you started and you say, hey, you stay there. Don't go anywhere and don't get any bigger. And, and it, listen, no, because then it grows. And when it goes and it continues to grow unchecked, right, it grows and it grows and it grows until it brings forth death. 100%. 1 Peter 5 eight it says, be be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I think that, I remember I was sharing that verse with somebody and they pointed out, they said, you know, that's a scary verse, right? Walks around as a roaring lion seeking, seeking whom he may devour. But the reality of it is, he said, as a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion at all. He thinks he's a roaring lion. He's pretending to be a, ro a roaring lion, right? But he doesn't have to be. We're the one that allows him to be, right? And then when we start thinking about, okay, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may stumble, who he may get to sin, no, seeking whom he may devour. That's his goal. His goal is not just to stumble you. He wants to ruin you. John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, 
to kill and to destroy. Those are his plans for you. Those are his plans for your family. Those are his plans for your children. Do not be deceived, but every good gift comes from above. And I would like to agree with all of that because um, I think if we took a little, if I asked everybody to make a list of everything that they were most, most thankful for in their life, the top of that list would be the things that money can't buy. And it's the things that God himself did provide for us, whether it be relationships, health, all of these lists that are things that directly tie to God. And then he goes on, and then he, he starts talking about something that is relationship gold. So then, my brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And I'm going to tell you that verse right there can single-handedly save marriages. That one verse can save marriages. Not just marriages, but honestly, I think if we applied that verse to our life, it would, be, it would make all of our relationships look different. If we were learned, if we were learned to be slow to wrath because we actually learned to be swift to hear and slow to speak. Much of our anger, like a lot of our anger comes when I'm focused on myself. Like if you want to be offended and you want to get angry, have somebody say something that they don't appreciate to you or do something to you that you don't appreciate, right? But being swift to hear, being swift to hear who's the focus on? Focus is on somebody else. You are pouring out your attention, not on yourself, right? But you're, you're giving your attention and the focus on somebody else, right? Slow to speak. Who's the focus on? If I'm slow to speak, it's because my focus is on the person who's going to be receiving this message, not just saying whatever I want to say, right? So more so in the slow to wrath, right? Because the slow to wrath, it will never produce like man's wrath will never produce the righteousness of God. So it's basically saying that if you want to be okay, then what you need to do is don't be all about yourself. Don't be about yourself when, you know, just take your time and listen to what other people say. Don't be quick to jump to your own um, defense. Be slow to what you say to somebody else and make sure that it lands right. Because to be honest, the wrath of man, at least personally, you know what it usually uh, produces? Well, first of all, the wrath of man is usually focused on ourselves. I, I needed to get this off my chest. I need jerk reaction and I do this. I'm going to teach them a lesson. But if we're honest, the wrath of man usually ends up being regret. Because it's always, when we let, let our, our wrath go, we always end up regretting it. And then we make our way to the flesh. He says, lay aside filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Put it aside. Like, we need to get rid of that. We need to let it go. And if this exists in anybody in this room, and it, honestly, it exists in all of us, right? All that means is we are heading in the wrong direction. So, and if we are heading in the wrong direction, we need to, what's the word I'm, I'm going to go for? Yeah, we need to repent. The literal word repent means that it's a change of direction. And now, the gold part of the chapter, but be doers of the word and not only hearers. And I don't know if you guys listened to like all of the prayers that Abuna pray um, during Vespers, during the liturgy, but there's this one that's always been gold and I've loved it since I was like, like, like in college. And whenever we are going to read the gospel in the church, there's a certain prayer that Abuna says. And he says, make make us to be worthy to hear and act according to your holy gospel. And I will tell you that we might be really, really good at 50% of that statement. We might have gotten really good at hearing, but the prayer and the focus of even the church, this is, it's to hear and act according to the gospel. To do, to feel good about God's word without doing anything is deceiving yourself. And it's actually quite the opposite. It is each one of you guys will be held accountable more when you walk out of that room right now if you do absolutely nothing with what the Holy Spirit's been guiding you to do today. And, and I like what he basically says because he says that it's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror and he observes himself and he goes away and he immediately forgets 
the kind of man that he is. And that's a very real illustration for me. Like, I don't know if you've got young kids who get themselves ready in the morning, but you ever have a kid who shows up in the morning and you just look at him and like for me, the question I always say is, dude, did you even look in the mirror today? Like they show up, like they've got like a collar like way up here, his hair's going that way. And I'm like, did you even look in the mirror this morning, right? And then sometimes I'll be like, bro, go fix yourself, right? And then another time I'd be like, you know what? No, I'm not gonna let you go look in the mirror. Go to school like that, <laughs> right? I was like, go to school like that. He's like, no, I can't go to school. You already told me something's wrong. And I was like, and I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but like go to school like that. Cause if you didn't look, then that's, this is, that's the best teacher of all teachers that could ever happen, right? But the reality is, is when we look in the mirror, what's the, what's the purpose, right? When we look in the mirror, I'm hoping it's not just to admire yourself, right? But I am hoping that you're looking at yourself to basically see, hey, is everything here okay? Is there anything that I need to put in place? And that's the same exact thing that the word of God does for us. When we step into the word of God and God reveals things to us, what he's basically saying is, this is out of place. This is out of place. This is out of place. And how foolish would, be, would we be the same way as like one of my kids that when I say, hey man, like this is out of place, you need to go fix yourself. He says, no dad, I'm good. Like we can't be like that. When God reveals these things to us, we have to, we have to know. And, sorry, I, I'm, I'm a little bit long, but I'm almost done. And if anyone among you thinks that he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This one's religion is useless. Like, let that sink in, right? If you think that you're religious and you cannot control your tongue, or at least not trying to control your tongue, you are deceived and your religion is useless. That's a scary thought. So my question for you is, how is your tongue? Do you control it? And do you even care to control it? Because that's a very convicting verse. And if you don't, then today you need to start. Because if you don't care, your religion is useless. And the thing that I was thinking about was all of our religion could be completely and utterly useless if it doesn't translate into change into our life. If we're showing up every single week we're attending the liturgy from the very morning. You come and you attend Bible study and you come to Asheya and you do all of these things, but there is no life change or God is not being glorified in your life at all. And you are not noticing that things are out of place. Then what are you here for? Like if you perfected yourself, mabruk <laughs> on your pride, <laughs> right? <laughs> because none of us have gotten there, right? So my question is, and, and this is a little bit convicting, even for, like I was convicted for this, right? But if we are not translating what we're doing here into life change, what are we doing here in the first place? Is it because this is a great place to bring your kids? Because you hope that your kids grow up moral? You hope your kids are gonna be, you know, you grew up better than you and they're gonna be, and, and look, we all want our kids to be better than us. But the hope shouldn't be just for your kids' improvement. It should be for all of our improvement. And I hope that we can apply these words and we can grow them in our life. And then my last thing is just, I love what he says here. Pure and undefiled religion before God is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their trouble and to keep one's self unspotted from the world. And what I really love about that, what he's basically saying is if you want to have perfect this perfect religion, it's to care for the lowly, care for the people who can't offer much to you, be selfless, help those who cannot help themselves, love the forgotten, and help those who need it, and then be unspotted from the world. And I love this because he doesn't say retreat from the world. He doesn't say don't be a part of the world, right? But he says be unspotted by it. Because we are in the world, we are in the world to shine his glory, we are in the world to point to a master and a savior who has radically changed all of our lives, but we are to stay unspotted from it. It reminds me of the three holy youth when they were in the fiery furnace, and it says that they were in the fiery furnace all night, right? And there was, it was hot, and it was smoky, and you can imagine everything else that it must have been. 
They said when they came out, they did not stink. There was no smell of smoke on them. And that is what we are called to be here in this world. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for allowing us to gather again on this uh, for the adult meeting, Lord. We ask that this meeting be used for your glory. We ask, Lord, that this meeting room for us, Lord, would just be so full of your presence, Lord, that we can't deny it. When we come here, that we meet with you, that the Holy Spirit just stirs inside of us, Lord. I ask that this meeting be a meeting, Lord, like looking in a mirror where you will show us everything that's out of place. For, Lord, we know what your desire is for us, Lord. You know, we know it's to draw us closer to you. We know it's to find, you know, our true state of how much we need you and how much when we chase after other things, Lord, it just becomes so much work. So, Lord, I ask that you allow us just to, to look up to you and to pursue you and to cast away all of the, the fleshly things, Lord. Turn aside from the sins that are distracting us, Lord. So that we can truly be full because we know that you are the only one that can fill us and that we will just reflect your love to those around us lord i ask that you just bless this group lord i ask that you bless this meeting and i ask it be a place lord of just sanctification i ask that you have mercy on us lord that you forgive us our many sins lord and that your blood just wash all of that away may we hear these prayers lifted in the sessions of your holy virgin mother the faith took of St. Mary, all the saints and martyrs. Here's we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory for amen.